Lewis's Medical Surgical Nursing, 11th edition, Chapter 37, Vascular Disorders, Selected Reading Assignment, pages 800 through 813. Problems of the vascular system include disorders of the arteries, veins, and lymphatic vessels. These problems can result in decreased perfusion to the peripheral tissues, causing ischemia. Patients often have pain and difficulties with mobility and taking part in the activities of daily living. Education is a key part of management. Proper nutrition, smoking cessation, and exercise are important health promotion behaviors. Following measures to promote safety, especially for those on anticoagulant therapy, is critical. We classify arterial disorders as atherosclerotic, aneurysmal, and non-atherosclerotic vascular diseases. Atherosclerotic vascular disease is divided into coronary, cerebral, peripheral, mesenteric, and renal artery disease. This chapter discusses peripheral artery disease, aortic aneurysm, and dissection, and venous diseases. Peripheral artery disease, PAD, involves thickening of artery walls. This results in a progressive narrowing of the arteries of the upper and lower extremities. PAD prevalence increases with age. It typically becomes symptomatic between ages 50 and 70 years. In people with diabetes, PAD occurs earlier. In the United States, about 8.5 million people over age 40 have PAD, with higher prevalence in blacks. PAD is strongly related to other types of cardiovascular disease, CVD, and their risk factors. Patients with PAD have a significantly higher risk for mortality in general, CVD mortality, major coronary events, and stroke. PAD is a marker of advanced systematic atherosclerosis. Patients with PAD are more likely to have coronary artery disease, CAD, and or cerebral artery disease. Unfortunately, many people in the United States are unaware of PAD and its risk factors. PAD remains underdiagnosed and undertreated. Etiology and pathophysiology. The leading cause of PAD is atherosclerosis, a gradual thickening of the intima, the innermost layer of the arterial wall, and media, middle layer of the arterial wall. This results from cholesterol and lipids deposited within the vessel walls and leads to narrowing of the artery. Although the exact cause of atherosclerosis is unknown, inflammation and endothelial injury plays a major role. Atherosclerosis often affects certain segments of the arterial tree. These include the coronary, carotid, and lower extremity arteries. Other risk factors for PAD are similar but not identical to those for CAD. Important risk factors for PAD are tobacco use, most important, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and age over 60. The presence of multiple risk factors dramatically increases the risk for PAD, especially in blacks. Symptoms occur when vessels are 60 to 75 percent blocked. Peripheral artery disease of the lower extremities. Lower extremity PAD may affect the iliac, femoral, popliteal, tibial, or perineal arteries, or any combination of these arteries. The femoral popliteal area is the most common site in non-diabetic patients. Patients with diabetes tend to develop PAD in the arteries below the knee. Those with advanced PAD often have multiple arterial occlusions. Clinical manifestations. The severity of PAD symptoms depends on the site and extent of the blockage and the amount of collateral circulation. The classic symptom of lower extremity PAD is intermittent claudication. This ischemic muscle pain is caused by exercise, resolves within 10 minutes or less with rest, and is reproducible. The ischemic pain is due to the buildup of lactic acid from anaerobic metabolism. Once the patient stops exercising, the lactic acid clears and the pain subsides. PAD of the iliac arteries causes claudication in the buttocks and thighs. Calf pain indicates femoral or popliteal artery involvement. As many as one-third of patients with PAD report classic symptoms. Others have no symptoms or present with atypical leg symptoms, e.g. burning, heaviness, pressure, soreness, tightness, weakness. In atypical locations, e.g. ankle, foot, hamstring, hip, knee, shin. 
PAD involving the internal iliac arteries may result in erectile dysfunction. Paresthesia, numbness or tingling, in the toes or feet may result from nerve tissue ischemia. True peripheral neuropathy occurs more often in patients with diabetes and in those with long-standing ischemia. Neuropathy causes severe shooting or burning pain in the extremity. It does not follow particular nerve roots and may be present near ulcerated areas. Gradual, reduced blood flow to neurons causes loss of pressure and deep pain sensations. So patients may not notice lower extremity injuries. The limb's appearance gives vital information about reduced blood flow. The skin becomes thin, shiny, and taut. The lower legs lose their hair. Pedal, popliteal, or femoral pulses are decreased or absent. Pallor, blanching of the foot, develops when the leg is elevated, elevation pallor. Conversely, reactive hyperemia, redness of the foot, develops when the limb is in a dependent position, dependent rubor. As PAD progresses and involves multiple arterial segments, continuous pain develops at rest. Rest pain most often occurs in the foot or toes. It is worse, worse with limb elevation. Rest pain occurs when blood flow is insufficient to meet basic metabolic requirements of the distal tissues. Rest pain occurs more often at night because cardiac output tends to drop during sleep, and the limbs are at the level of the heart. Patients often try to achieve pain relief by gravity, dangling the leg over the side of the bed or sleeping in a chair. Critical limb ischemia, CLI, is a condition characterized by chronic ischemia, rest pain, lasting more than two weeks, non-healing arterial leg ulcers, or gangrene of the leg from PAD. Patients with PAD who have diabetes, heart failure, and a history of a stroke are at increased risk for CLI. Complications. Lower extremity PAD progresses slowly. Prolonged ischemia leads to atrophy of the skin and underlying muscles. Minor trauma to the feet, e.g. stubbing one's toe, blister from shoes, can result in delayed healing wound infection and tissue necrosis, especially in the patient with diabetes. Arterial ischemic ulcers most often occur over bony prominences on the toes, feet, and lower legs. Non-healing arterial ulcers and gangrene are the most serious complications. If PAD develops over an extended period, collateral circulation may prevent gangrene. Amputation may be needed if adequate blood flow is not restored or if severe infection occurs. Uncontrolled pain and severe spreading infection are indicators for amputation in people who are not candidates for revascularization. Diagnostic studies. Various tests assess blood flow and the vascular system. Doppler ultrasound with duplex imaging maps blood flow throughout the entire region of an artery. When palpating a peripheral pulse is hard because of severe PAD, Doppler ultrasound can determine the degree of blood flow. A palpable pulse and a Doppler pulse are not equivalent, and the terms are not interchangeable. Segmental BPs are obtained using Doppler ultrasound and a sphygmomanometer at the thigh, below the knee, and at ankle level while the patient is supine. A drop in segmental BP of greater than 30 millimeters of mercury suggests PAD. Angiography and magnetic resonance angiography show the location and extent of PAD. The ankle brachial index, ABI, is a PAD screening tool. It is done using a handheld Doppler. The ABI is calculated by dividing the ankle systolic BPs, SBPs, by the higher of the left and right brachial SBPs. PAD guidelines recommend uniform reporting of ABI results. Calcified and stiff arteries in older patients and those with diabetes often show a falsely elevated ABI. Interprofessional care. Risk factor modification. The first treatment goal for patients with PAD is to reduce CVD risk factors, regardless of the severity of symptoms. Encourage risk factor modification with both drug therapy and lifestyle changes. Hypertension is another well-known risk factor for PAD progression. 
Encourage reducing dietary sodium and following the dietary approaches to stop hypertension dash diet. Tobacco cessation is essential to reduce the risk for CVD events, PAD progression, and death. This is a complex, difficult process with a high incidence of relapse. Suggest comprehensive tobacco cessation strategies. Diabetes is a major risk factor for PAD. It increases the risk for amputation. Patients with diabetes should maintain a A1C below 7% and optimally as near as possible to 6%. Support aggressive lipid management for all patients with PAD. Both dietary interventions and drug therapy are needed. Statins, e.g. simvastatin, Zocor, and a fibric acid derivative, gemfibrozil lopid, may be used. Drug therapy. ACE inhibitors, e.g. ramipril, altase, can reduce PAD symptoms. Antiplatelet agents are critical for reducing the risk for CVD events and death. Oral antiplatelet therapy should include low-dose aspirin therapy. Aspirin-intolerant patients may take clopidogrel, Plavix, daily. Combination antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel may be used by select high-risk patients. Anticoagulants, e.g. warfarin, Coumadin, are not recommended for prevention of CVD events in patients with PAD. Two drugs are available to treat intermittent claudication, thalostazole and pentoxifalin. Thalostazole, a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, inhibits platelet aggregation and increases vasodilation. Pentoxifalin, a xanthine derivative, improves the flexibility of RBCs and WBCs and decreases fibrinogen concentration, platelet adhesiveness, and blood viscosity. It is not as effective as solostazole. Solostazole is usually stopped within three months due to side effects. Exercise therapy. A supervised exercise program is recommended as part of the initial treatment for all patients with intermittent claudication. Exercise should be done for 30 to 45 minutes a day at least three times a week for a minimum of three months. Although walking is most commonly prescribed, other modes of exercise, e.g. cycling, improve walking ability and quality of life. Encourage taking part in exercise is particularly important for women with PAD. Women have faster functional decline and greater mobility loss than men with PAD. Overall, patients with PAD who have higher levels of daily physical activity have better survival rates. Nutritional therapy. Teach patients with PAD to maintain a body mass index less than 25 kilograms per meter squared and a waist circumference less than 40 inches for men and less than 35 inches for women. Even modest sustained weight loss of 3 to 5% yields important reductions in triglycerides, glucose A1C, and the risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Greater weight loss has greater benefits. Recommend a diet reduced in calories and salt for obese or overweight persons. Complementary and alternative therapies. Patients taking antiplatelet agents, NSAIDs, and anticoagulants should consult with their HCP before taking any dietary or herbal supplements because of potential interactions and bleeding risks. Care of the leg with critical limb ischemia. Optimal therapy for the patient with CLI is revascularization via bypass surgery using an autogenous native vein. An alternative is percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, PTA. Patients with CLI or not candidates for surgery or PTA may receive IV prostanoids, e.g. iloprost, ventavis. However, the FDA has not approved this drug for CLI treatment. Patients with CLI should continue optimal drug therapy, e.g. statin, antiplatelet, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker. 
to reduce the risk for a CVD event. Conservative management includes protecting the extremity from trauma, decreasing ischemic pain, preventing and controlling infection, and improving perfusion. Carefully inspect, cleanse, and lubricate feet to prevent skin cracking and infection. Avoid lubrication between the toes and soak in the patient's feet to prevent skin maceration or breakdown. Keep the affected foot clean and dry. Cover any ulcers with a dry, sterile dressing. Deep ulcers are treated with a variety of wound care products. Healing is unlikely without increasing the blood flow. Encourage the patient to wear soft, roomy, and protective footwear and avoid extremes of heat and cold. Keep the patient's heels free of pressure. Place a pillow under the calves so that the heels are off the mattress or use a commercially available heel protection device. Giving analgesics and placing the bed in the reverse Trendelenburg position may control pain and increase perfusion to the lower extremities. Spinal cord stimulation may help manage pain for patients with CLI. Other promising strategies include growth factors and gene and stem cell therapy to stimulate blood vessel growth and geogenesis. Unfortunately, almost half of patients with CLI die within five years. Interventional radiology catheter-based procedures. Interventional radiology catheter-based procedures are alternatives to open surgery for treatment of lower extremity PAD. These procedures take place in a catheterization laboratory rather than an operating room. All these procedures are similar to angiography in that they involve the insertion of a specialized catheter into the femoral artery. PTA procedure uses a catheter that has a balloon at the tip. The end of the catheter is moved to the narrowed stenotic area of the artery. The balloon is then inflated, compressing the atherosclerotic intimal lining. Stents, expandable metallic devices, are placed within the artery after the balloon angioplasty. The stent holds the artery open. Angioplasty balloons and peripheral stents may be coated with a drug, e.g. PAC lytic cell to limit the growth of new tissues in the treated area and improve long-term patency rates. Atherectomy is the removal of the obstructing plaque. A directional atherectomy device uses a high-speed cutting disc and cuts long strips of the atheroma. Laser atherectomy uses ultraviolet energy to break up the atheroma. Other types of atherectomy catheters have a diamond-coated tip that rotates at a high speed like a dental drill. Cryoplasty combines PTA and cold therapy. A specialized balloon is filled with liquid nitrous oxide, which changes to gas as it enters the balloon. Expansion of the gas results in cooling to 14 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 10 Celsius. The cold temperature limits restenosis by reducing smooth muscle cell activity. Nursing care is the same as for diagnostic angiography. Antiplatelet agents are needed post-procedure to reduce the risk for restenosis. Long-term low-dose aspirin therapy or clopidogrel is recommended. Surgical therapy. Various surgical approaches can be used to improve blood flow beyond a blocked artery. When possible, par peripheral artery bypass surgery is done with an autogenous vein to bypass, carry blood around the legion. Synthetic grafts are used for long rounds, such as an axillary femoral bypass. When a person's own vein is not available, human umbilical vein or a composite sequential bypass graft, native vein plus synthetic graft, can be used. PTA with scenting also may be done in combination with bypass surgery. Other surgical options include endarterectomy, opening the artery and removing the obstructing plaque, and patch graft angioplasty, opening the artery, removing plaque, and sewing a patch to the opening to widen the lumen. In hospital, mortality is higher in women undergoing revascularization than men, regardless of disease severity or procedure done. Amputation may be needed if tissue necrosis is extensive, gangrene or osteomyelitis develops, or all the major arteries in the limb are blocked. We make every effort to preserve as much of the limb as possible to improve rehabilitation potential. 
nursing management, lower extremity, peripheral artery disease, nursing diagnosis. Nursing diagnosis for the patient with PAD may include ineffective tissue perfusion activity and tolerance. Planning. Nursing care focuses on the priority problems of poor tissue perfusion and pain. The overall goals for the patient who has lower extremity PAD include 1. Adequate tissue perfusion. 2. Relief of pain. 3. Increased exercise tolerance. 4. Intact healthy skin on the extremities. 5. Increased knowledge of disease and treatment plan. Nursing implementation. Health promotion. Assess the patient for and provide instructions on how to control CVD risk factors. Teach diet modification to reduce cholesterol cholesterol, saturated fat, and refined sugars. Teach proper foot care and injury prevention. Encourage patients with positive family histories of cardiac diabetes or vascular disease to obtain regular follow-up care. Acute care. After surgical or radiologic intervention, observe the patient in a recovery area. Check the operative extremity every 15 minutes initially and then hourly for color, temperature, capillary refill, presence of peripheral pulses, and sensation and movement. Immediately notify the HCP of any loss of palpable pulses or change in the Doppler sound over a pulse. Postoperative ABI measurements are not obtained as they place the patient at risk for graft thrombosis. Compare assessment findings with the patient's baseline with findings in the opposite limb. PAD patients with a history of chronic ischemic rest pain may have developed a tolerance to opioids, thus aggressive pain management may be needed after surgery. After the patient leaves the recovery area, continue to monitor extremity perfusion. Assess for complications such as bleeding, hematoma, thrombosis, embolization, and compartment syndrome, dramatic increase in pain, loss of previously palpable pulses, extremity pallor, cyanosis, numbness or tingling, or cold extremity suggest graft or stent blockage. Report these findings to the HCP at once. Do not place the patient in knee flex position except for exercise. Turn the patient in position frequently with pillows to support the incision. On post-operative day one, assist the patient out of bed several times. Walking even short distances is desirable. A walker may be helpful, especially for frail older patients. Discourage prolonged sitting with legs lowered since it may cause pain and edema. Increase the risk for venous thrombosis and place stress on the suture lines. Graduated compression stockings may help control leg edema. If edema develops, position the patient supine and elevate the leg above heart level. Surgical site infection SSI is a serious complication. Careful postoperative assessment and wound care are important. SSIs are associated with early graft loss, longer hospitalizations, reoperation, and sepsis. If no complications occur, discharge occurs three to five days after surgery. Ambulatory care. Assess for CVD risk factors. Be alert for opportunities to teach patients health promotion strategies. Continued tobacco use dramatically decreases the patency rates of grafts and stents and increases the risk for an MI or stroke. Long-term antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel is used after surgery. Patients have distal peripheral bypass surgery, i.e. below the knee, using synthetic graft materials receive dual antiplatelet therapy, clopidogrel plus aspirin, for one to three months, followed by lifelong single antiplatelet therapy. Encourage supervised exercise training after revascularization. Explain that exercise decreases CVD risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, and glucose levels. Teach foot care to all patients with PAD. Meticulous foot care is especially important in the patient with diabetes and PAD. Diabetic neuropathy increases the patient's risk for injury and results in delay in seeking treatment. Tell patients to inspect their legs and feet daily for changes in skin color and temperature. Show patients how to check skin temperature and capillary refill and to palpate pulses. Stress reporting any changes in these findings or the development of ulceration or inflammation to the HCP. Thick or overgrown toenails and calluses are potentially serious and need regular attention by an HCP, e.g. podiatrist. Patients who have poor eyesight, back problems, obesity, or arthritis may need help with foot care. Encourage patients to wear clean, all cotton or all wool socks and comfortable shoes with rounded, not pointed, toes and soft insoles. Tell patients to lace shoes loosely and to break in new shoes gradually. Evaluation. The expected outcomes are that the patient with PAD of the lower extremities will have adequate peripheral tissue perfusion, increased activity tolerance, effective pain management, knowledge of disease and treatment plan. 
Acute arterial ischemic disorders, etiology and pathophysiology. Acute arterial ischemia is a sudden interruption in the arterial blood supply to a tissue, an organ, or an extremity that, if left untreated, can result in tissue death. It is caused by embolism, thrombosis of an atherosclerotic artery, or trauma. Embolization of a thrombus from the heart is the most frequent cause of acute arterial occlusion. Heart conditions in which thrombi can develop include infective endocarditis, mitral valve disease, atrial fibrillation, cardiomyopathies, and prosthetic heart valves. Non-cardiac sources of emboli include aneurysms, ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque, recent endovascular procedures, and venous thrombi. Thrombi that originate in the left side of the heart may dislodge and travel anywhere in the systemic circulation. Most emboli block an artery of the leg where vessels branch, e.g. iliofemoral, popliteal, tibial, or narrow. Sudden local thrombosis may occur at the site of an atherosclerotic plaque. Hypovolemia, e.g. shock, hyperviscosity, e.g. polycythemia, and hypercoagulability, e.g. chemotherapy, predispose a person to thrombotic arterial occlusion. Traumatic injury to an extremity may cause partial or total arterial blockage. Acute arterial occlusion may develop from arterial dissection in the carotid artery or aorta or from a procedure-related arterial injury, e.g. after angiography. Clinical manifestations. Manifestations of acute arterial ischemia include the six P's, pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, paralysis, and poikilothermia, adaptation of the limb to the environmental temperature, most often cool. If you detect these signs, immediately notify the HCP. Without immediate intervention, ischemia may progress to tissue necrosis and gangrene within a few hours. Paralysis is a late sign of acute arterial ischemia and signals death of nerve supply in the extremity. Foot drop occurs from nerve damage. Because nerve tissue is extremely sensitive to hypoxia, limb paralysis or ischemic neuropathy may persist even after revascularization. Interprofessional care. Early diagnosis and treatment are essential to keep the affected limb viable during acute arterial ischemia. Anticoagulant therapy with IV unfractioned heparin, UH, is started to prevent thrombus growth and inhibit further embolization. In patients undergoing emboloectomy, UH should be followed by long-term anticoagulation. To restore blood flow, the thrombus is removed as soon as possible. Options consist of surgical thrombectomy. Recommended procedure. Percutaneous catheter-directed thrombolytic therapy. Percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy with or without thrombolytic therapy or surgical bypass. Percutaneous catheter-directed thrombolytic therapy using Alteplase or urokinase is recommended for acute arterial ischemia of less than 14 days. The HCP inserts a catheter into the femoral artery and moved it to the side of the clot, and the thrombolytic drug is continuously infused. Thrombolytic agents work by directly dissolving the clot over a period of 24 to 48 hours. Close monitoring is required to make sure the catheter does not move and the patient does not bleed from the site of the catheter insertion. Surgical revascularization may be used in a patient with trauma, e.g. laceration of the artery, or with significant arterial blockage. Amputation is reserved for patients with ischemic, rest pain, and tissue loss in, whose, in whom limb salvage is not possible. If the patient is at risk for further embolization from a persistent source, e.g. chronic atrial fibrillation, Long-term anticoagulation is recommended. Thromboanginitis obliterans. Berger's disease is a non-atherosclerotic segmental recurrent inflammatory disorder of the small and medium arteries and veins of the arms and legs. Rarely, cerebral, coronary, mesenteric, pulmonary, and or renal arteries may be involved. The disease occurs mostly in men younger than 45 years of age with a long history of tobacco and or marijuana use without other CVD risk factors.
e.g. hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. In the acute phase of Berger's disease, an inflammatory thrombus blocks the vessel. Over time, the thrombus becomes more organized and the inflammation in the vessel wall subsides. During the chronic phase, thrombosis and fibrosis in the vessel cause tissue ischemia. The symptoms of Berger's disease often are confused with PAD and other autoimmune diseases, e.g. scleroderma. Patients may have intermittent claudication of the feet, hands, or arms. As the disease progresses, rest pain and ischemia ulcerations develop. Other signs and symptoms may include color and temperature changes of the limbs, paresthesia, superficial vein thrombosis, and cold sensitivity. There are no laboratory or diagnostic tests specific to Berger's disease. The diagnosis is based on age and onset history symptoms, involvement of distal vessels, presence of ischemic ulcerations, and exclusion of autoimmune disease, diabetes, thrombophilia, inherited tendency to clot, and other sources of emboli such as atherosclerosis and aneurysm. The main treatment for Berger's disease is a complete cessation of tobacco and marijuana use in any form. Use of nicotine replacement products is contraindicated. Conservative management include avoiding limb exposure to cold temperatures, a supervised walking program, antibiotics to treat any infected ulcers, and analgesics to make the ischemic to manage the ischemic pain. Teach patients to avoid trauma to the extremities. IV iloprost ventavis, a prostaglandin analog that promotes vasodilation, is used to manage rest pain, promoting healing of ischemic ulcers and decrease the need for amputation. Surgical options include lumbar sympathectomy, transection of a nerve ganglion, and or plexus of the sympathetic nervous system, implanting a spinal cord stimulator, microsurgical flap, and Omental transfer, bypass surgery, and stem cell therapy. Sympathectomy and a spinal cord stimulator can improve distal blood flow, reduce pain, and decrease the rate of amputation, but neither alters the inflammatory process. Bypass surgery typically is not an option because of the involvement of smaller distal vessels. It may be used in select patients with severe ischemia. Stem cells can differentiate into specialized adult cells with the potential to become any tissue in the human body. Stem cell therapy promotes ulcer healing, new blood vessel formation, and nerve cell regeneration. Painful ulcerations may require finger or toe amputations. Amputation below the knee may be needed in severe cases. The rate of amputation in those who continue tobacco or marijuana use after diagnosis is much higher than the, in those who stop. Raynaud's phenomenon. Raynaud's phenomenon is an episodic vasospastic disorder of small cutaneous arteries, most involving the fingers and toes. It occurs more often in women, especially those between 15 and 40 years of age. Pathogenesis of Raynaud's phenomenon is due to abnormalities in the vascular, intravascular, and neuronal mechanisms that cause vasodilation. Raynaud's phenomenon may occur in isolation, primary Raynaud's phenomenon, or with an underlying disease, e.g. thyroid condition, scleroderma, systemic lupus, secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. Other contributing factors include the use of vibrating machinery or work in cold environments, exposure to heavy metals, e.g. lead, and high homocysteine levels. Diagnosis is based on persistent symptoms for at least two years. Patients with Raynaud's phenomenon should have routine follow-up to monitor for development of connective tissue or autoimmune diseases. Raynaud's phenomenon is characterized by vasospasm-induced color changes of fingers, toes, ears, and nose, white, blue, and red. Decreased perfusion results in pallor, white. The digits then appear cyanotic, bluish-purple. These changes are followed by ruber, red, a hyperemic response when blood flow is restored. The patient usually determines coldness and numbness in a vasoconstrictive phase. This is followed by throbbing, aching pain, tingling, and swelling in the hyperemic phase. 
episode usually lasts only minutes, but may last for several hours. Exposure to cold, emotional upsets, tobacco use, and caffeine often bring on symptoms. After frequent prolonged attacks, the skin may become thickened and the nails brittle. Sometimes complications include punctate, small hole, lesions of the fingertips, and superficial gangrenous ulcers. Patient teaching is the focus of nursing care for Raynaud's phenomenon. Focus your instructions on preventing episodes. Tell patients to avoid temperature extremes and wear loose warm clothing as protection from the cold, including gloves when handling cold objects. The patient should stop using all tobacco products and avoid caffeine and other drugs that have vasoconstrictive effects, e.g. cocaine, amphetamines, ergotamine, pseudoephedrine. Provide patients with appropriate stress management strategies. Immersing hands in warm water often decreases the vasospasm. Sustain release calcium channel blockers, e.g. nifedipine, procardia, are the first line drug therapy. They relax smooth muscles of the arterioles by blocking the influx of calcium into the cells. This reduces the frequency and severity of vasospastic attacks. If symptoms persist. Other vasodilators, e.g., phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, sildenafil, or topical nitroglycerin. 2% ointment may be used. Calcium channel blockers can be taken with nitroglycerin topical ointment. Uh, P5 inhibitors are not used with topical nitroglycerin due to risk for hypotension. Prompt intervention is needed for patients with digital alter ulceration or critical ischemia. Treatment options include prostacillin infusion therapy, e.g. iloprost, antibiotics, analgesics, and surgical debridement of necrotic tissue. Botulinum toxin A and statins may lessen the severity of Raynaud's. Sympathectomy is done only in severe cases refractory to medical treatment where digit survival is threatened. Aortic aneurysms. The aorta is the largest artery and supplies O2 nutrients and blood to all vital organs. One of the most common problems affecting the aorta is an aneurysm, which is permanent, localized, outpouching, or dilation of the vessel wall. Aneurysms occur in men more often than women, and in whites more often than blacks. The incidence increases with age. Aneurysms may occur in more than one location. Etiology and pathophysiology. Aortic aneurysms may involve the aortic arch and thoracic and or abdominal aorta. Three-fourths of aortic aneurysms occur in the abdominal aorta, and one-fourth in the thoracic aorta. Most abdominal aortic aneurysms, AAAs, occur below the renal arteries. A variety of disorders are associated with aortic aneurysms. The main causes are classified as degenerative congenital mechanical, e.g. penetrating or blunt trauma, inflammatory, e.g. Aortitis, Takeyasu's arteritis, or infectious, e.g., aortitis, chlamydia, pneumonia, human immunodeficiency virus. Risk factors for aortic aneurysms include age, male gender, hypertension, CAD, family history, tobacco use, high cholesterol, low, cl low extremity PAD, carotid artery disease, previous stroke, and obesity. Tobacco use is the most important modifiable risk factor. The larger the aneurysm, the greater is the risk for rupture. Okay. Genetic link. Both aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection has a strong genetic component. The familial tendency is related to several congenital anomalies. Examples include bicuspic aortic valve, cork, of the aorta, Turner syndrome, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, specific collagen defects, e.g. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and premature breakdown of vascular elastic tissue, e.g. Marfan syndrome. Classification. Aneurysms are classified as true or false aneurysms. A true aneurysm is 
one in which the wall of the artery forms aneurysm with at least one vessel layer still intact. True aneurysms are subdivided into fusiform and saccular types. Fusiform aneurysm is circumferential and relatively uniform in shape. A saccular aneurysm is pouch like with a narrow neck connecting the bulge to one side of the arterial wall. A false aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm is not an aneurysm. <clears throat> it is a disruption of all arterial wall layers of bleeding that is contained by surrounding anatomic structures. False aneurysms may result from trauma, infection, peripheral artery, bypass graft surgery, side of the graft to artery anastomosis, or arterial leakage after removal of cannulae, e.g. femoral artery catheters, intra-aortic balloon pump devices. Clinical manifestations. Thoracic aortic aneurysms, TAAs, are often asymptomatic. When present, symptoms include deep, diffuse chest pain that may extend to the interscapular area. Sending aorta and aortic arch aneurysms can cause 1. Angina from decreased blood flow to the coronary arteries, 2. Transient ischemic attacks from decreased blood flow to the carotid arteries, and 3. Uh, coughing, shortness of breath, hoarseness, and or difficulty swallowing from pressure on the laryngeal nerve. The aneurysm presses on the superior vena cava. Decreased venous return can result in jugular venous ascension and edema of the face and arms. Triple A's are often asymptomatic. They are often found during routine physical examinations or evaluations for an unrelated problem, e.g. abdominals, x-ray, CT scan. A pulsatile mass in the peri-umbilical area slightly to the left of the midline may be present. Breeze may be auscultated over the aneurysm. Physical findings may be hard to detect in obese persons. AAA symptoms may mimic pain associated with abdominal or back disorders. Impression of nearby anatomic structures and nerves may cause symptoms such as back pain, epigastric discomfort, altered bowel elimination, and intermittent claudication. Sometimes aneurysms spontaneously embolize plaque, causing blue toe syndrome, patchy modeling of the feet and toes in the presence of palpable pedal pulses. Complications. Aneurysm rupture is the most serious complication. It is more likely to occur in people who smoke tobacco. If rupture occurs into the retroperitoneal space, bleeding may be controlled by surrounding anatomic structures, preventing exsanguination and death. In this case, the patient often has severe back pain. Back or flank ecchymosis, gray turner sign, may be present. If rupture occurs into the thoracic or abdominal cavity, Patients can die from massive hemorrhage. The patient who reaches the hospital will be in hypervolemic shock with tachycardia, hypertension, pale clammy skin, decreased urine output, altered level of consciousness, and abdominal tenderness. In this situation, simultaneous resuscitation and immediate surgical repair are needed. For patients submitted to the hospital with a ruptured AAA, in-hospital mortality is high at 53%. Diagnostic studies. Chest x-rays are done to reveal abnormal widening of the thoracic aorta. An abdominal x-ray may show calcification within the aortic wall. An ECG may rule out MI since the thoracic aneurysm or dissection symptoms can mimic angina. Echocardiography assesses the function of the aortic valve. Ultrasound is useful for aneurysm screening and to monitor aneurysm size. A CT scan or MRI can diagnose and assess the location and severity of aneurysm. Angiography uh, gives helpful information by using contrast imaging to map the entire aortic system. Interprofessional care. The main goal of interprofessional care is to prevent the rupture of an aneurysm. Early detection and prompt treatment are essential. Conservative medical therapy for small asymptomatic AAAs less than 5.4 centimeters is the best practice. 
This consists of risk factor modification, ceasing tobacco use, decreasing BP, optimizing liver profile, gradually increasing physical activity. Patients should receive medical management for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and other CVD risk factors. A statin and an ACE inhibitor could prove to be beneficial. Those are small aneurysms, 4 to 5.4 centimeters, should have monitoring of aneurysm size using ultrasound or CT every 6 to 12 months. Ultrasound monitoring every 3 years is done for patients with AAA smaller than 4.0 centimeters in diameter. Surgical repair is recommended in patients with asymptomatic aneurysms 5.5 centimeters in diameter or larger. Surgical intervention may occur sooner if the patient has a genetic disorder, e.g. Marfan's Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The aneurysm expands rapidly, the patient becomes symptomatic, or the risk for rupture is high. Careful review of body systems is needed to identify any comorbidities as they affect the patient's surgical risk. Correcting existing carotid or coronary artery blockages may be needed before aneurysm repair. Surgical therapy. For elective aneurysm repair surgery, the patient should be well hydrated with normal electrolytes, coagulation, and hematocrit. If the aneurysm ruptures, emergent surgery is required. Open aneurysm repair, OAR, involves a large abdominal incision through which the surgeon, one, cuts into the diseased aortic segment, two, removes any thrombus or plaque, Three, sutures a synthetic graft to the aorta proximal distance of the aneurysm. And four, sutures a native aortic wall around the graft to act as a protective cover. For iliac artery aneurysms, a bifurcated graft replaces the entire disease segment. With saccular aneurysms, it may be possible to excise only the bulbous lesion and repair the artery by primary closure, suturing the artery together or applying an autogenous or synthetic patch graft. All OARs require aortic cross-clamping proximal and distal to the aneurysm. Most resections are done in 30 to 45 minutes. Then the clamps are removed and blood flow is restored. The risk for postoperative complications such as acute kidney injury increases in patients who have OAR or AAAs above the level of the renal arteries. Endovascular graft procedure. Minimally invasive endovascular aneurysm repair, EVAR, is an alternative to OAR for select patients. Eligibility criteria include iliofemoral vessels that allow for safe graft insertion and vessels of sufficient length and width to support the graft. EVAR involves the placement of a sutureless aorta graft into the abdominal aorta inside the aneurysm by the femoral artery. Grafts are made of various materials, such as a Dacron cylinder consisting of several sections and supported with multiple rings of flexible wire. The main section of the graft is bifurcated, it is delivered through a femoral artery catheter. The second part of the graft is inserted through the opposite femoral artery. When all graft components are in place, they are deployed against the vessel wall by balloon inflation. The blood then flows through the endovascular graft, preventing further expansion of the aneurysm. Angiography is done afterward to check for any leaks and to confirm patency of all stent graft components. The aneurysmal wall shrinks over time because the blood is diverted through the endograft. Complications. EVAR is less invasive than OAR and requires a shorter hospital stay. EVAR also has fewer complications such as paraplegia and death. The most common complication of AAA repair is endoleak, a seepage of blood back into the old aneurysm. This may result from an inadequate seal at either graft end, a tear through the graft fabric, or leakage between overlapping graft segments. Repair may require coil embolization, insertion of beads for hemostasis. Other complications include aneurysm growth over or below the graft, aneurysm rupture, aortic dissection, bleeding renal artery occlusion caused by stent migration, graft thrombosis, incisional site hematoma, and incisional infection. 
Patients undergoing EVAR need periodic imaging for the rest of their lives to monitor for an endoleak, document stability of the aneurysm sac, and determine the need for surgical intervention. Potentially lethal complication is an emergency repair of a ruptured AAA, is a development of intra-abdominal hypertension, IAH, with associated abdominal compartment syndrome. Persistent IAH reduces blood flow to the viscera. Abdominal compartment syndrome refers to the impaired organ perfusion caused by IAH and resulting multisystem organ failure. IAH is confirmed by measuring patient's intra-abdominal pressure indirectly through a catheter and transducer system. Treatment goals include control of situations that lead to IAH. Interventions include open surgical decompression, percutaneous drainage, and percutaneous drainage combined with a thrombolytic infusion. Consecutive measures such as intubation, ventilation, patient positioning, gastric decompression, cautious fluid resuscitation, pain management, and temporary hemofiltration are used. Nursing management aortic aneurysms. Nursing assessment. Begin by performing a thorough history and physical assessment because atherosclerosis is a systemic disease. Look for signs of coexisting cardiac, pulmonary, cerebral, and lower extremity vascular problems. Monitor the patient for signs of aneurysm rupture. These include diaphoresis, pallor, weakness, tachycardia, hypotension, abdominal, back groin, or peri-umbilical pain. Changes in level of consciousness or a pulsating abdominal mass. Establish baseline data to compare with later assessments. Pay special attention to the character and quality of the patient's peripheral pulses and renal and neurologic status. Before surgery, mark pedal pulse sites, dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial, with a single-use marker and document any skin lesions on the lower extremities. Planning. The overall goals for the patient undergoing aortic surgery include 1. Normal tissue perfusion, 2. Intact motor and sensory function, and 3. No complications related to surgical repair such as thrombosis infection or rupture. Nursing implementation, health promotion. To promote overall health, encourage the patient to reduce CV risk factors, include controlling BP, ceasing tobacco use, and maintaining normal body weight and serum lipid levels. These measures also help ensure continued graft patency after surgical repair. Counsel the patient about taking part in moderate physical activity. Acute care. Before surgery, provide emotional support and teaching to the patient and caregiver. Preoperative teaching includes brief explanation of the disease process, planned surgical procedures, preoperative routines, what to expect right after surgery, e.g. recovery room tubes, drains, and usual post-operative timelines. Specific routines vary by agency and HCP. In general, aortic surgery patients may have bowel preparation and skin cleansing with an antimicrobial agent the day before surgery. Have NPO after midnight the day of surgery and receive IV antibiotics before the incision is made. Patients with a history of CVD should receive a beta blocker, e.g. metoprolol low pressure. Scheduling a preoperative visit to the ICU may be helpful to the patient and caregiver. After surgery, patients typically go to an ICU for 24 to 48 hours for close monitoring. When the patient arrives in the ICU, various devices are in place. These include an endotracheal tube for mechanical ventilation, an arterial line, a central venous pressure CVP catheter, peripheral IV lines, an indwelling urinary catheter, and a nasogastric tube. The patient needs continuous ECG and pulse oximetry monitoring. If the thorax is opened during surgery, chest tubes will be in place. The patient may have lumbar catheter draining cerebrospinal fluid to prevent neurologic deficits. Pain medication is given via subcutaneous infusion into incision site, e.g. on cue pain pump, epidural catheters, or IV patient-controlled analgesia PCA. In addition to the usual goals of care for a postoperative patient, e.g. maintaining adequate respiratory function, fluid and electrolyte balance, and pain control, check for graft patency and renal perfusion. Watch for and intervene to limit or treat cardiac ischemia, dysrhythmias, infections, VTE, and neurologic complications. Graft patency. 
An adequate BP is important to maintain graft patency. Prolonged low BP may result in graft thrombosis. Give IV fluids and blood components as ordered to maintain adequate blood flow. Monitor CBP or PA pressures and urine output hourly in the immediate postoperative period to assess the patient's hydration and perfusion status. Avoid severe hypertension, which may stress the arterial anastomoses, resulting in leakage of blood or rupture at the suture lines. Drug therapy for IV diuretic CG furosemide or IV antihypertensive agent CG labetalol, metoprolol, hydrology, and sodium nitroprusside nitride may be indicated. Cardiovascular status. Myocardial ischemia or infarction may occur in the perioperative period because of decreased myocardial O2 supply or increased myocardial O2 demands. Dysrhythmias may occur because of electrolyte imbalances, hypoxemia, hypothermia, or myocardial ischemia. Nursing interventions include continuous ECG monitoring, frequent electrolyte and arterial blood gas terminations, O2 administration, IV antidysrhythmic and antihypertensive drugs, and electrolytes as needed. Adequate pain control and resumption of cardiac drugs. Infection. A prosthetic vascular graft infection is rare, but potentially life-threatening complication. Nursing interventions to prevent infection include giving a broad-spectrum antibiotic as prescribed, assess temperature regularly, and promptly report elevations. Monitor laboratory results for high WBC count, which may be the first sign of an infection. Ensure adequate nutrition and assess the surgical incision for signs of infection, e.g. redness, swelling, drainage. Keep surgical incisions clean and dry and perform wound care as prescribed. Use good hand washing and strict aseptic technique in the care of all peripheral arterial and CVP catheter insertion sites since these are ports of entry for bacteria. Meticulous perineal care for the patient with an indwelling urinary catheter and early catheter removal are essential to minimize risk for urinary tract infection. Gastrointestinal status. After OAR, postoperative ileus may develop because of anesthesia and handling of the bowel during surgery. The intestines may become swollen and bruised and peristalsis ceases for variable intervals. A retroperitoneal approach decreases the risk for bowel complications. An NG tube may be present and connected to low intermittent suction to decompress the stomach, prevent aspiration of stomach contents, and decrease pressure on suture lines. Record the amount and character of the NG output. While the patient is NPO, provide frequent oral care. Ice chips or lozenges can help soothe their dry, irritated throat. Assess for bowel sounds every four hours. Note the passing of flatus as a signal of returning bowel function. Encourage early ambulation since this will help the return of bowel function. Postoperative ileus rarely lasts beyond the fourth postoperative day. If the blood supply of the bowel is disrupted during surgery, ischemia or infarction, death of intestinal tissue may result. Manifestations of this rare but serious complication include absent bowel sounds, fever, abdominal distension, and pain, diarrhea, and bloody stools. If bowel infarction occurs, immediate reoperation is needed to restore blood flow with resection of the infarcted bowel. Neurologic status. Neurologic complications can occur after aortic surgery. When the ascending aorta and aortic arch are involved, assess the patient's global consciousness, pupil size, and response to light, facial symmetry, tongue position, speech, upper extremity movement, and quality of hand grasps. When the descending aorta is involved, perform a neurovascular assessment of the lower extremities. Record all assessments and report changes from baseline to the HCP immediately. Peripheral perfusion status. The location of the aneurysm determines what type of peripheral perfusion assessment to do. Check and record all peripheral pulses hourly for several hours and then routinely based on agency policy. When the ascending aorta and aortic arch are involved, assess the carotid radial and temporal artery pulses. For surgery of the descending aorta, assess the femoral, popliteal, posterior tibial, and dorsalis pedis pulses. You may need a Doppler to assess peripheral pulses. Check skin temperature and color, capillary refill time and sensation and movement of the extremities. Sometimes lower extremity pulses may be absent for a short time after surgery because of vasospasm and hypothermia. Decreased or absent pulse together with a cool, pale, mottled, or painful extremity may indicate embolization of graft occlusion. 
Report these findings to the HCP at once. Craft occlusion requires reoperation if identified early. It is essential to compare your findings with the preoperative status to determine the cause of deceased or acid pulse and the proper treatment. In some patients, pulses may have been absent before surgery because of coexistent PAD. Renal perfusion status. The patient will have an indwelling urinary catheter after surgery. In the immediate postoperative period, record hourly urine output. Further evaluate renal function by monitoring daily BUN and serum creatinine levels. CVP pressures give vital information about hydration status. Maintain accurate fluid intake and output and record daily weights until the patient resumes a regular diet. Decreased renal perfusion can occur from embolization of an aortic thrombus or plaque to one or both renal arteries. This causes ischemia of one or both kidneys. Hypotension, dehydration, prolonged aortic clamping during surgery or blood loss can lead to decreased renal perfusion. Irreversible renal failure may occur after surgery, particularly in high-risk people, e.g. patients with diabetes. Ambulatory care. Teach the patient and caregiver to gradually increase activities once home. Fatigue, poor appetite, and regular bowel patterns are common. Have the patient avoid heavy lifting for six weeks after surgery. Report any redness, swelling, increased pain, drainage from incisions, or a fever greater than 100 Fahrenheit, 37 planets Celsius, to the HCP. Teach the patient and caregiver to look for changes in color or warmth of the extremities. Patients and caregivers can learn to palpate peripheral pulses to assess changes in their quality. Sexual dysfunction in male patients is common after aortic surgery. A referral to a urologist and counseling may be useful if erectile dysfunction occurs. Evaluation expected outcomes are that the patient who undergoes aortic surgery will have patent to your graft with adequate distal perfusion, adequate urine output, no signs of infection. Aortic dissection. Aortic dissection, often misnamed dissecting aneurysm, is not a type of aneurysm. Rather, dissection results from the creation of a false lumen between the intima interlining and the medial middle layer of arterial wall. Aortic dissection is classified based on the location of the dissection and duration of onset. Type A dissection affects the ascending aorta and arch requiring emergency surgery. Type B dissection begins in the descending aorta allowing for potential conservative management. We also describe dissections as acute, first 14 days subacute, 14 to 90 days or chronic greater than 90 days based upon symptom onset. Etiology and pathophysiology. Non-traumatic aortic dissection is caused by weakened elastic fibers in the arterial wall. Chronic hypertension hastens this process. In aortic dissection, a tear develops in the inner layer of the aorta. Blood surges through this tear into the middle layer of the aorta, causing the inner and middle layers to separate, dissect. If the blood-filled channel ruptures through the outside aortic wall, aortic dissection is often fatal. As the heart contracts, each pulsation increases the pressure of, on the damaged area and worsens the dissection. Extension of the dissection may cut off blood supply to the brain, kidney, spinal cord, and extremities. The false lumen may remain patent, become thrombose, clotted, rejoin the true lumen by way of a distal tear or rupture. Men are at a higher risk for developing aortic dissection than women. Women who develop aortic dissection are older more likely than men to prevent with HF coma or altered mental status. Hypertension is the most important risk factor for aortic dissection. Other predisposing factors include age, aortic diseases, e.g. aortitis, coarctation, arch hypoplasia, atherosclerosis, blunt trauma, tobacco use, cocaine or methamphetamine use, congenital heart disease, e.g. bicuspid, aortic, valve, Connective tissue disorders, e.g. Marfan syndrome, family history, history of heart surgery, and pregnancy. Clinical manifestations. About 80% of patients with type A aortic dissection report an abrupt onset of severe anterior chest or back pain. Patients with acute type B aortic dissection are more likely to report pain in their back, abdomen, or legs. Pain location may overlap between type A and type B dissections. Pain may be described as sharp and worst ever, or as tearing, ripping, or stabbing. 
Dissection pain can be distinguished from MI pain, which is more gradual and onset and has increasing intensity. As the dissection progresses, pain may follow the path of the dissection. Older patients are less likely to have an abrupt onset of pain and more likely to have hypotension and vague symptoms. Some patients have a painless aortic dissection, emphasizing the importance of the physical examination. If the aortic arch is involved, the patient may have neurologic deficits. These include altered levels of consciousness, weakened or absent carotid and temporal pulses, and dizziness or syncope. Type A aortic dissection usually disrupts blood flow in the coronary arteries and causes aortic valve insufficiency. When either subclavian artery is involved, the radial ulnar and brachial pulse quality and BP readings may be different between the left and right arms. So dissection progresses down the aorta, the abdom abdominal organs and lower extremities show evidence of decreased tissue perfusion. Complications. A severe and life-threatening complication of an acute ascending aortic dissection is cardiac tamponade. This occurs when blood from the dissection leaks into the pericardial sac. Manifestations of tamponade include hypotension, narrowed pulse pressure, jugular venous distension, muffled heart sounds, and pulsus paradoxus. An aorta weakened by dissection may rupture. Hemorrhage may occur into the mediastinal, pleural, or abdominal cavities. Aortic rupture typically results in an exsanguination and death. Aortic dissection can lead to occlusion of the blood supply to vital organs. Spinal cord ischemia leads to weakness and decreased sensation and rarely to complete lower extremity paralysis. Renal ischemia can lead to renal failure. Abdominal mesenteric ischemia can occur and cause abdominal pain, decreased bowel sounds, altered bowel function, and bowel necrosis. Diagnostic studies. Diagnostic studies to detect aortic dissection are similar to those for suspected aneurysms. An ECG can help rule out cardiac ischemia. A chest x-ray may show a widening of the media, steinum, and pleural effusion. MRI, 3D CT scanning, and transesophageal echocardiography, TEE, are equally reliable for the diagnosis of acute aortic dissection. A CT scan or MRI can give more detailed information on the severity of the dissection and related complications, e.g. pericardial effusions, carotid dissection. TEE is preferred in very unstable patients. For those with contraindications to CT or MRI, e.g. those with metal implants, allergies to contrast material. Interprofessional care. Patients with acute aortic dissection are managed in the ICU. The initial goals of therapy for acute aortic dissection without complications are heart rate and BP control and pain management. HR and BP control reduces aortic wall stress by decreasing SVP and myocardial contractility. An IV beta blocker e.g. Esmolol Brevablock is titrated to a target heart rate under 60 beats per minute or SBP between 100 and 110 millimeters mercury. Calcium channel blocker, e.g. Dilatazem, can be used to lower HR if a beta blocker is contraindicated. Reducing the HR, BP, and myocardial contractility limits extension of the dissection. Morphine decreases sympathetic nervous system stimulation and relieves pain. Supportive treatment for an acute aortic dissection serves as a bridge to surgery. Conservative therapy. The patient with an acute or chronic type B aortic dissection without complications can be treated conservatively. Conservative treatment includes pain relief, HR and BP control, and CVD risk factor modification with post-surveillance imaging. The CT or MRI. Endovascular dissection repair. Endovascular repair is a treatment option for acute type B aortic dissections with complications, e.g., hemodynamic instability and chronic type B aortic dissection with complications, e.g., peripheral ischemia. Thoracic endovascular aortic repair, TVAR, is similar to EVAR. Fewer post-surgical complications occur with TVAR. However, TVAR does not prevent the risk for renal failure, paraplegia, or stroke. A lumbar spinal drain may be inserted to help decrease or prevent neurologic complications. 
The lumbar drain is used. Strict aseptic technique is essential to prevent infection. Surgical therapy. An acute type A aortic dissection is a surgical emergency. Mortality rate is 50% within 48 hours of symptom onset. Otherwise, surgery is indicated when conservative therapy is ineffective or when complications, e.g. HF, occur. Open surgical repair is recommended for patients with a chronic dissection who have a connective tissue disorder or an aneurysm greater than 5.5 centimeters. The aorta is fragile after dissection. Surgery is delayed when possible to allow time for edema to decrease and to permit blood clotting in the false lumen. Surgery involves resection of the aortic segment with the intimal tear and replacement with a synthetic graft. Even with prompt surgical intervention, the in-hospital mortality is high. Cause of death include Aortic rupture, mesenteric ischemia, MI, sepsis, stroke, and multi-organ failure. Nursing management aortic dissection. Preoperative nursing care includes keeping the patient in bed in a semi-fowler's position, maintaining a quiet environment. These measures help to keep the HR and SVP at the lowest possible level that maintains vital organ perfusion, typically HR less than 60 beats per minute, SVP between 100 to 120. Give opioids and sedatives as ordered. Manage pain and anxiety because they can cause elevations in the HR and SVP. Titrating IV antihypertensive agents requires careful supervision, including continuous ECG monitoring and BP monitoring. Monitor vital signs frequently, sometimes as often as every two to three minutes until target HR and BP are reached. Look for changes in peripheral pulses and signs of increasing pain, restlessness, and anxiety. Postoperative care is similar to that uh, after OAR. In preparation for discharge, focus on patient and caregiver teaching. All patients with a history of aortic dissection require long-term health care to control HR and BP. Help patients understand that they need to take antihypertensive drugs daily for the rest of their lives. Beta blockers are used to control HR and BP and decrease myocardial contractility. ACE inhibitors, e.g. lisinopril, zestrel, are given if the patient cannot tolerate beta blockers. It is important that patients understand the drug regimen and side effects, e.g. dizziness, depression, fatigue, or erectile dysfunction. Tell the patient to discuss any side effects with HCP before stopping any medication. Follow-up with regularly scheduled MRIs or CTs is essential. The most common cause of death in long-term survivors is aortic rupture from redissection or aneurysm formation. Tell patients that if the pain or other symptoms return, they should activate the emergency response system for immediate care.